Just always enjoying the tunes at the beginning. You know, I, I come across these, uh, these what are they, five, six hour long of copyright free music. And uh, some of them are just really good remixes. And so uh, thank you to the, uh, the, to the music gods for providing that for free. <laughs> well, and, and good morning, everybody. Good morning, Christian. Hello. Hello. Hello and welcome to another episode of Microsoft Community Hours, uh, Community Office Hours, sorry, uh, where we'll be discussing all things Microsoft 365 and answering questions from the community. My name is Christian Buckley. I'm an Office Apps and Services MVP and a Microsoft Regional Director and the Microsoft Go-To-Market Director at AvPoint. And joining me today are Tracy Vanderskiff, an Office 365 Coach, Office Apps and Services MVP and Principal of the Good Stuff based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Good morning. Hello. Also joining our, uh, let's see, Mike Nelson, a solutions architect with Pure Storage and a cloud and data center management MVP, the odd man out for this show, as always, <laughs> based in Appleton, Wisconsin. And Hal Hostetler, senior field engineer with Roland Shore and Tower in Tucson, Arizona, and also an office apps and services MVP. And we will have a little bit Ooh, later, Neil Hodgkinson had an overlap. So Neil will be joining late and Sean will try He's away from the home office and we'll try to get back in time to join, uh, but we'll excuse him. No excuses for Mr. Eric Riz. Uh, I don't know what it, what he's doing this morning, but um, mm -hmm. you know, no thank you cards, no no reporting in. So is the odd man out here, as you call it? Is that am I just here for eye candy? Is that it? Is what apparently, yeah. Okay. That's right. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that's why you're paid the big dollars, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Still waiting so, to see those big dollars. Yeah, you know, uh, we're, we all are. Uh, we are all. But, <laughs> but for our program today, so we're going to be going through and reviewing the latest Message Center updates. Any juicy tidbits today, Mike? Of course, Christian. Okay. All right. What would a week, what would a week be without it? Hey, I don't want to do all this additional spend on this fancy theme music for the lead into your segment without, you know, that <laughs> additional spend. <laughs> What, you're sitting there going, dee, 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 right. yeah. Yeah. I, I was trying to copy exactly that, exactly what you did. <laughs> said, I need to have some music like this, and then that's what I did. Yeah. Wow. Discla disclaimer, <laughs> please. Yeah, but, so that we're going to do that, and then we're going to jump in with questions to the community. And yes, and we have our official disclaimer here. I'll share that on screen. Yeah, I, I do that. No animals, children, or mimes were harmed, although we all want to harm the mimes. We do. So it is yeah. It is with great restraint that uh, that does not happen. So anyway, anything else going on, Tracy? No. Uh, you, you gonna tell us, were you going to Were you going to get on and do a little soapbox or are you going to talk about? I uh, was, but of, now you're excluded from that because there's a circle of trust and this is you. <laughs> no. I'll just send Hal a private email afterwards so that you never That's ever right. become part of my conversations again. That's right. So for oh all that, uh, Tr Tracy was going to, sh she made the statement. As soon as she said it, she said, this before we were recording, she says, well, since told. we're not recording, I'll share kind of my, my thoughts about a topic. And so I hit record. <laughs> and that's why people that's don't Christian. confide in you, Christian. That's right. That's that's why I can't train my dog. It's why my my children are all, you know, mentally uh, messed up. I've, I've shared this. I know with with uh, some people before, but I uh, a couple of years back, I have four adult children, and we were sitting around having a family discussion and having some fun. And I said, uh, I said, let me let me ask, um, how have I, your father, messed you up? Um, with all of my jokes, my pranks and stuff on you throughout your childhood. So nobody just kind of laughed it off like, oh, dad, or they, everybody sat and went, hmm. 
And then the funny thing is that they each shared uh, the, the the thing the most, the way that I broke them. And, uh, and they all had different things. And as an example, my youngest who just got married, he said, uh, this is back in 2018. He says, I'll never be able to hug my future wife. Like, oh my. why? So, because my practice with him was, you know, come here, give, give, give me a hug, give me a kiss, good night, whatever it is, a little kid, and all the way up through his teens. He's like, no, you're going to tickle me. He's like, I'm not going to tickle you. He's like, you're going to tickle me. He's like, get over here right now, stern voice. And so he would come over, and I would bear hug, pin his arms, and then bury my face in the crook of his oh. neck, and then, and then just breathe heavily. And he start freaking out, tickling, you know, it's a freaking, and I'd say, whisper words, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong, Josh? You know, what's wrong? And he's just like, ah, freaking out. And uh, so, so every time somebody, and I and I didn't, I, I thought, I was like, I wouldn't mean I, I broke you, you can't hug somebody. And I watched my in-laws as they were leaving to drive back to California. My mother-in-law goes to give Josh a hug. My wife and I are watching from down the hallway. And she goes to give him a hug, and he goes, uh, and he flinches. <laughs> and that's how you broke him. And that's how I broke him. That's you terrible. Permanent, permanently scarred him. Permanently I scarred did. him. Yeah. I did. Well, now, now I'm going to have to tell my therapist about Christian as well, which yeah. is a big of mindful. Oh, my, my. my love has permanently scarred my child, so yes, that's right. What did you call it love, though? Uh, well, is, you know, something. Christian is a strange person. He really is. He's... He's quite such a nice word. Yeah. yeah. Well, we unique. have. I'm going unique. So, and just for so we have uh, so we have like Hans. I know you've got a question, so we we've got a segment in front of it. Feel free to type it here. If anybody's watching the live stream, feel free to type away, ask the question. Uh, we'll as soon as we get to the questions, we'll add it right to the top. Um, and so with that, Mike, you want to take us on the wild journey that is the Microsoft Message Center. <laughs> <laughs> the wild journey. Hmm. Okay. Sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So um, this, this has been a week of like massive updates to timelines. Once again, for some reason, they're shifting all the timelines. Everything's kind of getting pushed. Everything's, you know, uh, it's in true Microsoft fashion. Everything, instead of adding a whole bunch of new content or new features like they used to do, now it's all about pushing all the existing stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there are a couple things, uh, new features hey, that have come out this can week. Kind of a pause here, Mike. We are yeah. being joined by the venerable uh, Mark Rackley, uh, Chief yeah. Strategy yeah. Officer at Pate Group and an Office Apps yeah. and Services MVP. So yet another Office Apps and Services MVP based in Harrison, <laughs> Arkansas. So Mark, thanks for joining. Hey, thanks for having me. I just saw Tracy was on, so I had to join. I don't care so <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that I've got someone on my side because of the sicko Christian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh boy. That's right. All right. So Mike, back over. We're just about Mark to start with the message center updates. All right. So uh, in the feature confusion department at Microsoft, uh, PowerPoint Live. Okay. Uh, you you actually get a present to Teams function from PowerPoint for Windows. So you're in PowerPoint for Windows, and you now have a button that's going to say present to Teams, and it automatically present whatever you have in PowerPoint. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Um, the issue that I have with this is the requirements. They actually list a bunch of requirements. One is, you know, the obvious stuff. Latest Teams desktop app installed, latest PowerPoint installed. Um, you have to store the presentation on OneDrive for business or in SharePoint. And you have to, <laughs> this one is like, I can't believe somebody actually took the effort to put this, but you actually have to join a Teams meeting before clicking present in Teams. You can't click on present in Teams and then join the team meeting. Make sure you don't get that backwards. Uh, but this is a sticker right here. Uh, you have to be using a O365 E3, E5, or 365 for government license. Now, this is this is a button. OK, and it's a button to just basically take what you have in PowerPoint and put it up in Teams. Why do you need a specific license? Why is that? If you have Teams, why can't you just and you have PowerPoint? Why restrict this just to these licenses? 
It makes no sense to me. Are, are there other restrictions on, on other? I mean, I thought you know, E1 and F licenses, like you had the ability to uh, to to own a, a meeting. Is that yeah, not that, that's, correct? That's prob- no, I don't know that. I, I mean, maybe someone else does. But the point I'm trying to make is it's just a button that allows you to take something in PowerPoint and put it to Teams. Why is it that? Why do you have to have that pay that extra money? Why do you have to have that license to use that? That should be a, a standard feature in PowerPoint. Well, well but it's, I like mean, send, it's like send a OneNote, you know? But you don't, do you need Teams. PowerPoint? Do you need the PowerPoint desktop client or is it? PowerPoint online. Any, no, desktop. Well, no. Well, well yeah, with, you don't get desktop with E1. You get desktop with E3. That's true. I'm saying. Wait a you, minute. Buy, wait, wait, wait. I don't have an enterprise license because remember you have standard and business plans as well for small business. But that means I won't have that even though I've got desktop apps. That's correct. And not only yeah. that, but you could have Office 2019. Okay. And that's, you know, the latest PowerPoint. It doesn't say PowerPoint 365. It says PowerPoint 2019. So I can buy 2019 and I can have a free Teams. Why can't I present to that free Teams? Well, so my point, Mike, was that it, it, the license <laughs> should be, it should be consistent with wherever without that PowerPoint Live feature um, that you can present in a team meeting, own or present, you should be able to do that. That should be available to you. So not just restricted there. So it's confusing to me is that, I can create a team meeting and present in that meeting, but if you know if, if I want to use this new feature, use that button, I have to have an E3 or E5 or BGCC. That's correct. So, yeah, that it should be one and the same. If I can, you know, present content, you know, it's from, just a, it's from a, other license types, I should be yeah. able to have that available across the board. In my in my opinion, it's just another feature, like I mentioned, a feature. Uh, you know, confusion aspect. It, it really is. You know, it's you know, this is akin to this is when I, I'm trying to remember that one of the features where they Microsoft has announced, oh, with this great new feature that comes out for mobile for Android only. And, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the, the when they made that announcement. Yeah. and I have another yeah, one. I have another. Yeah, <laughs> I have another one coming up. Uh, okay. So, uh, moving on uh, from the it's about time department. From Microsoft, um, you have so now have the ability. I know you, you wouldn't believe the amount of departments they have. So they have icons, uh, but, for all yeah. Them. Yeah, I, 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 I bet hope. they do. Um, but they actually now have in public preview a tool to migrate content from Google Workspace to 365. How long have people been asking about this, and they've been going to third-party vendors, and now Microsoft is suddenly saying, "Oh, we've got this tool now. You can use it." It'll migrate all of your stuff uh, put into OneDrive, into SharePoint, and into Teams right from uh, Google Workspace. So I think this is this is awesome. I just think it, it took them way too long uh, to get to this point. So, yeah, there's there's been uh, you know many long discussions from the the ecosystem from the partners that have been oh, in the space. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that, they, that have had they this for a long time. Yeah, yeah. They they and the third parties have been making a lot of money off that and more power to them really, but Microsoft should have came out with a conversion tool a long time ago. Well, um, and, and for for and also those that may be saying, "So wait a second, I 2 years ago I leveraged Microsoft and I did some migrations with some things that Microsoft had something available." And I know Microsoft has had other migration tools, but they've actually white labeled partner solutions for a number of years as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so what we're talking about is that they've, now there's always the caveats with what Microsoft releases when they go in and and go in and, and, and I'll, I'll use the word compete, but it's their partner ecosystem, but they go build in features that third-party solution providers have provided for years around that. It's generally not the gold standard of migration. Like, I don't know this specifically. I've not leveraged it. I don't know if if anybody here has. It's just um, preview right now. It just turned public preview last week. So, but I'll I'll just I'll venture a guess that it has a lot of limitations I that the providers uh, don't. I would don't bet, have. but the, I think some of the advantages is that it does more than just move a mailbox. You know, because you have some provided third party providers that all they would do is move a mailbox from you know Gmail up to 
365. It's saying it moves your OneDrive, it moves your SharePoint into SharePoint. So I'm assuming a lot of engineering on the back end there to get like Google Sites moved into a SharePoint and all that other kind of fun stuff. So yeah, that's you know. So I personally not done migration. I'm not in that line of business. Mark, I don't know if you, if you guys have done any of those from over from Google Workspace or the Gmail side of things, but a couple, not many. Yeah, but in generally speaking about migrations, they're a very iterative process. So a word of warning to anybody looking to go and make that move, and hopefully, hopefully you realize you've been around long enough to understand that. You're not going to use any magical tool and move 100% over a weekend and you're up and running with something. It's it, it's going to be moving chunks bit by bit. You've got to do the mapping. You've got to figure out what other customizations, whatever connections to other line of business applications, other systems, workflows, other automations that have been built that can really slow down that process. And then you get the fun experience of unknown reasons why huge portions of your environment failed to migrate over and go and figure out what what happened there but migrations are a lot of fun so uh moving on since christian has taken up all my time talking about migrations you have um, as much time as you want mike come on no you no i don't you keep telling I me know, that no, and then you, you and don't. then off off air off air <laughs> he yells at me for taking too much time just so everybody knows that's that right. that's right um so that's this is coming person. from yeah, yeah what's some of this? From... I oughta. <laughs> I oughta. <laughs> Boy, I oughta. All right, this is Same coming from the bad. Yeah. This is coming from the bad idea department, um, and this ties in with the one that we had it's earlier. A, it's an unfortunate the, department name, by the way. <laughs> well, it is a Those bad idea. Those people don't get promoted. Yeah. They don't. They never get their their full annual bonus for some reason. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So all whiteboard storage, um, which I have used quite a bit. I actually, I actually really love um, the whiteboard functionality and the in they built in there. Uh, but all whiteboard storage now will be in by default in OneDrive for Business. So you can no longer store it locally. You can no longer store it in OneDrive. You have to store it in OneDrive for Business, which, as we all know, does not come with many of the Office 365 plans that are personal. So <clears throat> I actually have some folks that use this on a personal basis uh, to share things like, uh, as an example, they're sharing a bridal shower type of, of, of get together and they have it on a whiteboard, a Microsoft whiteboard. Well, they'll no, be, no longer be able to do that. Starting October of 2021, all newly created whiteboards will be stored as files in OneDrive for business. So you can, all of your existing whiteboards in OneDrive and in files have to be moved over to OneDrive for business. Bad idea, flat out bad idea, but that's me. Yeah, what, so, yeah, I wonder what, what the reasoning is for that. They give no reasoning. Because it is a very popular uh, yep. tool set. Hmm. Yeah, one of those things that make you go, hmm. Uh, so moving on, we're going to, you've got to go so I, to another. Once again, let me just point out, it was the bad ideas department that put that feature forward. So It was. Yeah. And the bad, you know what's right next to the bad idea department? It's the, we're going to need a bigger boat department. Oh, okay. And yeah, we need a bigger boat because now you can access files offline in mobile. Which means that your team's mobile app will now allow you to access files even when you're offline, which means that all of your team files will be stored locally on your mobile device, which means oh you will need a lot of memory on your mobile device. <laughs> but will it be a selective sync issue, though? I mean, I can't imagine they're just going to stick everything. Yeah, in I, there. I told them. Yep, you're absolutely right. Is simply select the files you need access to, and Teams will keep a downloaded version to use in your mobile app. However, how many users do you know that just check the box at the top? that selects all the files inside of a Teams chat. No, 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 Mike, I just <laughs> I just don't see end users being that oh, irresponsible. Yeah. I just can't envision that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I'm totally wrong on this, Christian, you're right. You're right, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. Oh, happy all right. 
That's going to yeah. be, man, you got to prep the support team for that. Wow. Yeah. It's called job security. Why are you complaining? I mean, you know. It's true. More bad ideas. Come on, more bad ideas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the larger boat division works. Uh, we're going to need a bigger boat department. Works very closely with the bad idea department. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and All also right. with uh, uh, people uh, don't get trained in companies department. Uh, yeah. A lot of those things aren't issues if people get trained. Sorry. Yeah. Tracy, people don't need training. People they they get they get the whole so office it's intuitive, yeah. thing. Intuitive yeah, it's intuitive. Like an iPad. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. These next two things are related and uh this is coming from the TIL department, which is today I learned for those of you that are not socially adept to, you know, the whole uh, abbreviated acronym language that's used out there on social media. Anyways, uh, I didn't know that there was such a thing called config.office.com. Um, anybody use that? Does anybody use config.office.com? I think I have once. Okay. Name's familiar. So it's really kind of interesting. I didn't know this existed, but uh, it's related to this next item I'm going to talk about. But this is basically a the apps admin center. This is where you can create policies and see uh, different things about your services and, and uh, be able to uh, look into the apps, uh, manage the applications that are available. Didn't know this existed, but uh, it's related to a, a correction. And yes, Christian, I am making a correction uh, to something that I previously, previously stated because it was it was something that uh, it was like, you know, trying to figure out how that would work, right? So last week, if you remember, um, I mentioned a uh, change they were making about being able to look at users' feedback to Microsoft. Right. And Right. And uh, I don't know if it was you or Neil, maybe it was you, that actually said, well, will they be able to see who submitted that right. feedback? Right. Yeah, I did say that. Because right. you can get into is a it, kind Is of it a, anonymized? Right. Is yep. it, right. Exactly. And what I found out was that they are actually, they have a field that says email that's submitted, but it just comes back as redacted. It has the word redacted in it. Hmm. So it's like it, it it's there, but they present it to the admin as the, term, the word redacted. I have no idea why. I don't even know why they have the field on there. I mean, if it's redacted, if it's going to be redacted every time, there's why have it there? Uh, but they're saying the only way that you can configure that is to go through this config.office.com and you have to configure a policy in order to allow your employees to, to provide feedback. So that's how I stumbled onto this, this uh, portal, which is kind of cool if you go out and take a look at it. But uh, mm-hmm. I had never known it was there. I'm suspecting that maybe with an E5 license, you can then change it to actually show the email address. <laughs> it could be. But if you think about it, if you think about it, Tracy, I bet that since that field is there, it's there to the point that you somehow you can go in and you can find out because it's it's just mask. That's all it is. It's just got that term redacted over the top, kind of like the the big black marker, you know, it goes over the top. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think what we should do is we should start a rumor that there's a very secret E7 license. (laughs) where all of these issues are resolved and that you have uber control. So anything like we question, like the logic of doing this or it's extra steps, it's like, well, in the E7 license, it resolves all of that. It's just, it's the Wait, magic the license. license. That should be the pro license. E, is it no, E5 pro? E5 pro? Just, just a now Microsoft, uh, Microsoft 365 pro just takes care of all your problems. Now we're going back to the whole Teams pro discussion. Don't get us started on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that may have been my my intention was to kind of yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that is it for the 365 message uh, center and updates. Thank you very much. And now that's right. Back Once again, Christian. there is nothing else that was announced through the message center. <laughs> nothing of any great import. Nothing you need to read through and pay attention to. According <sighs> to Mike. so again, again, I'm only given so much time. And <laughs> You know, I have to say that I can only do highlights because everything, I mean, literally updates, everything, like I said, it's updates. It's like, well, we moved the timeline for this. We moved the timeline for that. We we misspelled a word in our original posting, that type of thing. You yeah. Know? But I, I can point out all of them if you like. You know, the, sure there was a. 
There, there was a on that that point. I mean, there, there about the moving timelines, and there was an effort. You remember this? Uh, so I know uh, Mark. You know, you you probably recall this, um, where where uh, with SharePoint at least in the Jeff Teeper world, um, said that we're 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 kind of slowing down the rate of information out there. That we want to be sure that we know when it's going to be released before we then start talking about it. We don't want to get people excited. And there was, it seemed like, you know, an effort for a while by Microsoft to cross product teams to only talk about and only promote those things which were getting ready for preview or they're moving forward. And we seem to be, uh, you know, kind of slipped back into talking about things, getting people excited. When is this going to be available? Well, in early 2022, that feature we were we think will be available. It's like, why Why are you talking about that right now? Why are you telling us this information? Well, not you know, SaaS uh, apps. I mean, for for not for SaaS apps, they, they have to keep a running road, a roadmap, right? They have to keep that thing going. But I mean, for a non-SaaS app, like, a, a you know, an on PC office installation, well, yeah, we can say it'll come out sometime in 2022, you know? Yeah, well, I so my, my point was that they were trying to do a, a good job of, holding back on things until they were confident that it was going to be released. And now we get more of a mixture of things. And then we also, I, I, case in point, would be talking about things which are coming out. And not that I'm you know, bitter about the pushback of shared channels or anything, um, but then <laughs> you know, we get multiple delays to those <laughs> things pushed back. It's like, well, you know, again, it, it's great to have insight into the roadmap. Um, and and I, I'd almost say just say, call it a roadmap item and we don't have a date for when it's going to be available. We want to give people a heads up because there's various, um, you know, trial versions. There's the, we're working with a number of partners and customers on developing this. And so we want to give insight into it and feedback from the community around the high level architecture of those items, but don't put dates on it and then move the dates repeatedly. That's all I'm saying. And we're joined by Dr. Neil Hoskinson. Hello, and welcome Good back morning. from uh, from uh, your working vacation. Yes, glad you uh, <laughs> survived. Yes, it was I don't see a tan. To survive. I my tan. I don't tan. Where's your tan? I I, I I tan. I don't know. I go red, then I peel, then I'm white again. That's me. I'm English. I'm from Northern England. Yeah. We don't tan. Can't can't tell because you're swathed in the Keith Ritchie violet hues. Okay, I'll drop it off. But then guess what? I got my actual true vinyl yesterday. I haven't gotten mine yet. This is not uh, fair. I haven't gotten mine yet either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, fortunately, I live like several miles away from Keith, so he was, yeah. was going to do, do a personal delivery, but he opted for um for uh, through the post. So there we go. I'm still white. Look, white as white as white. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, excellent. Well, let's, we're ready to jump into questions and we may have, uh, Hans may have another question for us. I uh, didn't see that he posted one yet, but uh, I'll add that in here. Maybe the second one, if he responds here. So let's kick things off with question number one from Anju saying, I'm able to record a PowerPoint presentation on my, uh, uh, Microsoft teams, but my video isn't getting recorded simultaneously. Please help. record a PowerPoint presentation. So I reckon I needed more info on that. So it's either she means that it's out of sync or that this, when she says video, is it video and audio? Is it not too sure? Yeah, that was my question. Yeah. Because well. I think yeah. she's talking about, um, about the audio maybe that's delayed because that's what I first thought, but then I went like, no, I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, because my other thought too was it well, are you able to see your video prior to presenting, or is there just a fundamental is a problem where it's not recognizing your video feed? That could be another thing, because I know people have had issues with um, non-supported oh. cameras. If you have a new camera, and this has also happened with Teams where it worked and then it didn't work, and then it worked again, and then didn't work with some devices. Uh, there are some devices that just don't work with teams at all. 
But also um, remember, so so yes, yeah, so maybe that's about the PowerPoint and the video. Because I mean, if I have three screens and I've got my PowerPoint there, my Teams is here, I'm busy presenting, then then the recording records the team meeting with the recording in it, does it? What does it record? Or does it record the specific screen? It so you do you have the option to, to change that around whether you want to have your camera showing on or off? So whether it just shows the presentation or do you want to include your screen? That's yeah. probably it, you know, how it's presenting and what screen it's actually recording. Because now with that new little whatever little thing with a with the videos at the bottom, that uh, thing that I've got now where the presentation shows separate and then the, all the um, the faces at the bottom. Because it might just be a setting, I'd say, if it's not showing the recording. Well, another question out of the from the uh, straight from the need more information department. <laughs> yeah, all right, Mike. N M N M I. Yeah. Uh, no, is the, is also if you are uh, something that I occasionally forget if I'm using my camera in another application which isn't closed, so it can only be utilized by one source. Mm -hmm. That could be another reason why it's not working instead of Teams. So, yeah, this is when I think asking a couple follow-up <laughs> questions with Anju would probably get more to the heart of the issue. But I do know that some folks have, have run into this issue when they're using OBS um, because yep. the OBS virtual cam and not being able to use that. Um, Teams has always been flaky with OBS, um, but it's now you can't have a multiple source. So... If Teams is actually using that camera, if Teams is using OBS, I do know that it's caused problems with using not only presenting uh, uh, PowerPoint, but also presenting video. So OBS is old brown sherry, right? Because I also don't record about old brown sherry. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> <laughs> not a lot think, of stuff works well when I'm on old brown sherry. I think your recordings improve dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> Very entertaining. Yeah. Not always accurate, but yes. Yeah, true. <laughs> oh, my word. Good times. All right, question number two. Uh, Michael asks, I can add some people from uh, other organizations to my team or my channel, but on the other side, <laughs> they must change the organization to communicate with the other company. Then can I well. change this? So I can see all my teams in one dialogue. We know that. So, no. Yeah. So, so I just uh, with some of these two that uh, I, I think this might be one of the translated questions there from the Facebook community. Um, so uh, what I understand this is that um, you know people that are have access. Uh, you can add people to your team or channel but some people must change organization to communicate with another company. Well, you're talking Sounds about like the channel change. Well, I think, I think let's be, let's take this apart a little bit. He's saying he can add guests, right? Yeah. So from his aspect, he's talking about adding guests, Yep. but then he's saying from the other side, I have a feeling that it's from the guest side. Yes. So the guests yeah. that he mm -hmm. has added to teams, you go back to their side, that guest, and that guest uh -oh. cannot communicate with people inside of his org because they are a guest. They are not part of that organization. You have to switch the tenant to be able to participate in the chat. Yes. Yeah. Switch the tenants. That's what I said. Yep. We all yeah. want that. We'll put it on user voice. Yeah. Well, this is. A, yeah. I just got. I just got off a call. The call was established by a. I guess they're a federated partner with Microsoft. They're one of our partners, so it's a little different. That doesn't count, um, right? That doesn't. Count. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not true. Yeah, so I have. It's always <laughs> confusing for me. So I have connections that are through. So that I have my company, my Avpoint tenant, and I'm part of a Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, a uh, team. So I have that. That's that federated link. So I have communications with Microsoft people. I also have over a, a Microsoft tenant that they do a lot of external collaboration through, but I'll have some of those same contacts in both locations. Mm -hmm. And so I'll see a notification and go up and drop down and see that there's notifications in the other tenant. And sometimes, which is not frustrating at all, 
like the same conversation and they'll forget and they'll they'll chat with me on the same conversation thread but in those two different locations so it's not the same let me clarify it's not the same you know threaded conversation it's the same yep. topic in two different places so i have to patchwork quilt it together when i'm looking for the full story the full conversation but i'm sure that happens to nobody else <laughs> definitely not just yeah. you. No, just you, just you, just you, Christian. Yeah, you know, has anybody gone in? I, I somebody mentioned this a while back, but it said like that Microsoft has the tenant switching, so the true tenant switching, not just switching between guest accounts, yes. but the tenant switching on the mobile device. And somebody okay. said, "Well, I'm just going to run a, a an iOS emulator on my desktop with the with that app and have Teams and have it all in one place." You know, they're on my desktop and just leave it running all day. Has anybody tried that? I've heard about it. No, no. you have never, never tried it. Like, why would sounds you, like so much effort. Want that, yeah. yeah, why would why would you want that much overhead just to you know go through? Just that, to, because it's so annoying to switch in between and see it all in one location. Because you could then, in that view, leave it open and see all of the various guest networks and multiple tenant logins all from one screen and the notifications that pop in. So then all you would have to do from that, if you had that open in the emulator is click on that and jump right into that. So let relevant. me ask this is why wouldn't you have the mobile app on a actual device like a tablet sitting next to you that all it did was present that or application or that, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I have, so I have an iPad that is sitting uh, with a dead battery that I just I just haven't used in years. The kids used it, and maybe that's what I should go and do. Is just have it dedicated to that app, sitting next to me, taking up more of my my desktop, yeah. my physical desk space. Yeah. Anyway, just a thought. Um, all right. So, in, you know, any other last comments on Michael's question? So, it's just because they're in different, they're dialing through different tenants. So, if you're a guest, you know, then yeah, you have to be on that tenant that you were invited into to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. That's huh. why when you start dealing with a new company, I always create that team immediately. Then I'm not the guest. That's how you do right. it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> dips. Got dips. What, what I somebody be smart. <laughs> yeah. All right. I uh, just questions like cleaning out organizations I've been associated to. There's so many of them. Yeah. And, and yeah. the way you have to do it is going into you know your app profile and that kind of thing. It just, it just takes so long. The, here's a. This is a a great request for Cortana to make suggestions on groups that you've not uh, participated in for a certain amount of time. Why can't it be part of a, you know, a monthly recommendation? Like it does the productivity tips of, have you followed up on this task? Is this mm. still an open item? Have you replied back to this person and make that? Cause some, I just saw somewhere last week, somebody said, you know, part of their monthly process, they've set up a reminder on their calendar to go in and look at and purge any unused groups that they're a member of that's stupid that's like keeping keeping a clean inbox nobody does that i do <laughs> true one person did I that do not. <laughs> I, I, I simply can't yeah it's almost like at the anti of the viva platform right here's the no, thing I wish you're I not could. interested in anymore yeah i'm too ocd for that people i spent months yeah. in lockdown and i cleaned that baby up and i went to, i'm never ever letting that happen again and if you then do and, it daily it's gone and I only say that because I'm jealous because I'm not built that way. I can't do it. I can definitely charge yeah. for it. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> You'll clean my uh, inbox for me? Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to be much yeah. easier than mine was because I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, care if you I'll, lose projects, Mark. <laughs> alternatively, Mike, you'll get lots of email from Tracy saying, is this important to you? Is this important <laughs> to you? <laughs> And then a screenshot, and is this these five people? <laughs> so I've got, a, I've got a zero inbox and then a Tracy folder with 3,000 <laughs> items. In it. Okay. And then I'll create a planner task for each of the emails I want you to go and look at. <laughs> and 
That's job creation 101. But no, I'm proud to say zero miles in my mailboxes. I don't even look at my inbox. If it's not filtered, it's not important. Is that why yeah. you're responding? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's a different. That's a different mailbox. And yes, I have now. <laughs> so sure. Uh, we need to talk about workshop, though, Matt. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, question number three. Paul says. Um, question: Do you have to be using the same email address to log into Teams? as the email and invite was sent to? Or does it not matter as long as it's the, on the same machine as the mailbox, it just works? Painfully matters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your email address is technically, even though it's an email address, it's still your, it's technically your your ID, right? It's, it's, it's right. the identity that the invite was sent to, you know, the UPN. So I have, I have three emails Sorry, uh, is that true? Three emails that I use now with Teams. I had a fourth, but I, I well, no, that, I, that's that's not true. I do have one other. Crap, dang it. All right, um, four, so I have four. my, well, so I have my old Microsoft ID, which is associated with all of my MVP stuff, which I use for nothing else. And there, I've not logged into that email in like a decade. Then you have my, former now company, my community work, that's all done in my my MVP. Most of my activities are associated with that and my personal tenant and all that, which is collab talk stuff. I have my Avpoint tenant. I have my Microsoft community login and tenant. I had two other systems that were customer logins. These are not guest networks. These are full logins to that. So I have, so I often get meeting invites to my Microsoft ID one. I don't want it spammed, so I'm not going to talk about it. I have to that old ID that's only used specifically for my Microsoft tech community login, which is annoying as hell. The fact that I can't associate it with another email and log in there. So I, if I click on a link, it opens it as a guest every time. I have to forcibly read a Microsoft tech community article only via well if i now actually edge browser is able to differentiate so that's my default open of any link now is in edge browser because it at least has figured that out it knows who i am with the multiple profiles but you know mo other applications it'll open up um incorrectly and i can't read it uh, and so i will often get invites to things from the mvp program to that one email from people in the community and most other MVPs through my former work, my company email, and th things through my Avpoint. And I have to constantly ask people, hey, can you resend that invite over to this email address? <sighs> I'm so sorry you struggle with that, Kristen, because none of us. I'm sure it's. Of course. I know. I know it's, it's only me. I know. It, it, it's yeah. just you. All right. Question number four Jan asks. How can you preset Teams breakout rooms so even before the meeting starts? Is that even is that available yet? Yep. Yep. The pre. But you've you've got to set it up as the meeting starts. So I couldn't find any way to set it up before the meeting actually opens up. So you have to actually start the meeting, and then you can set up the rooms as people. So you can even like start 15 minutes early, set it up, and then as people join in. No, but you can't you can't create a meeting, and before you even hit the start button and preset those. So that's the feature. I, Microsoft has talked about that, but I just don't think it's available. I, I, I don't know if it's a user voice or if it's a roadmap thing. I have to go look at. But there's been discussion about being able to, at the point of the, the time of creation, to also set up breakout rooms. So that's good feedback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that is I on the bingo. Microsoft Bingo to always take a sip, or take a drink there. Oh. Is that is that your North Star? <laughs> Can you just stop already? All right. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, do, do, do. Okay. Question number five. Uh, Ashik says, uh, "How can I get a link to SharePoint lists form that can be shared with public?" 
I, we can copy a link to the SharePoint list form, but how to change to the privacy settings to public? Nope. Yeah. yeah I I think, That's Tracy, I think you cool. responded to that one. I think you responded to that one, Tracy, over on I Facebook. I did on, uh, on Facebook, yeah. You got to use an MS form. I mean, unless you want like a extra net environment, but that's not truly public. So, so, so what you could do if you have any dev skills and you could do it fairly easily is you could do an Azure static website, which is essentially free. You could then so you could create your form using a, a HTML JavaScript and then you can create a logic app that when they submit the form, it calls the logic app, which would put it into a SharePoint list. And we've done some things like that before, and that's so, relatively inexpensive. So for people that don't have dev skills like me, I would just go and create a Microsoft form and then power automate it back into SharePoint. Sounds easier, because that's yeah. what I normally do. But right. of course, the MS form doesn't have as many options. So I'm pretty sure your option has better options for fields, because the MS form is, my, is just a survey. It's not really a form. Yeah, exactly. If forms will work for you, absolutely use forms. It's so simple to use. But if you need business logic, if you need a custom URL, if you need, you know, all that stuff, then yeah, stat an Azure static website with HTML and JavaScript calling a logic app to stick into a SharePoint list is from a client side of dev, persp dev perspective is pretty quick. Yeah, it's not going to be for me. Just something on the forms that's, that's interesting. I think that a lot of people don't consider. Your MS forms data doesn't sit in your tenant necessarily in your country because it's shared data centers. So so I always warn my customers, especially now like say like with GDPR or with Popia Act now in South Africa and stuff, got to be very, very careful of using forms if that data center doesn't sit in your country. Because mm -hmm. there's, I mean, there's guidelines around that. So, and there's a lot of people doing crazy stuff with forms just because it's easy to do. You know, like my supplier vendor application form or my bank details change form. I'm like, hell no, it's not supposed to be that. <laughs> but um, no, it happens, eh? Are so, there any um, other, this is just kind of a broader question on that point. Are there any other of these kind of smaller services, these yeah. sub services that are also handled data differently than your primary they, Microsoft 365 data? It'd be interesting to have like a Matt Wade-esque you know, uh, uh, mapping of where a, your it, data is depending I'll on the services. Look for it. There is, a, there is a, a site where you can go and check it out, but I know that Forms was, Stream was at some point. Of course, that's changed slightly now, but um, Stream was also a shared uh, data center, same as Sway, which I don't know if any of you use Sway. I use Sway. But I'll quickly go and look and see if I can find that. That'd be a great resource to be able to provide. Yeah, if you could find that, Tracy. Because I didn't know that about Forms. I just assumed... It was like everything else when you have your designation of your location, the residency of your data, that that was true for any of those other services that you utilized. If that's not the case, there needs to be a mapping. And I, I mean, I like overthinking like the warnings and stuff, but in or you know countries that have you know a, a, high, a lot of regulations around the data residency, are there warnings when you attempt to use a system, you know, the, the service like forms that may not push data to your country of origin? So I don't know what that, that user experience is like. America, which is all one bucket. <laughs> <laughs> one language, one bucket. I don't know what the big deal is. Uh, just sorry. I like the the parks and recreation where Ron Swanson's over in uh, the UK, where he's trying to buy something. It's like this is here. Here's one dollar. It's like we don't take that. It's like of course you do. It's American dollar, finest currency hey. in the world. <laughs> Tracy, I found that link for you. You should be grateful to take it. Apparently, it's yeah. in America anyway. So for most people on this call, it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> That's right. Nice, nice. We're, it works just, for us. It works yeah. for us. <laughs> the, the, the link I just put in the chat, if you scroll down, it has the list of all countries where Microsoft 365 is available, and you can expand each individual country and see where each specific service stores its data. Oh, wow. Awesome. And for so most of the Americas, it's, it's the US, except unless you're in Brazil, because Brazil has its own data center. Right. And I will paste that over into the Facebook live stream as well. And it will be, well, the link to this will also be in both YouTube and out on the blog post 
uh, later this evening. So, excellent. Um, all right. Sridev, number six, says, I want to migrate my PST file into Office 365 or Exchange online. How and what is the process without using a migration tool? It's easy. Point. It's no. Fairly simple. No. <laughs> No. Uh, well, okay. I thought so those who would rather do yes, then uh, there is yep. a, this is what you do is you go to, in your Outlook client, you go to file, you go to uh, open and export, import and export, import from another program or file, and then you pick Outlook data file. Now that's if you want to import it. I would prefer, however, the way I do that is to do file, open and export, and just simply open Outlook data file, point it at the PSD, and then it's there. It appears over in your nav pane. You can drag and stuff, drop stuff at your leisure. It, doing it that way also preserves things like date and timestamps, which have a tendency on an import to get messed up. Yep. And it's fairly it's simple and quite straightforward. I've done it dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and... Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, bringing, the, bringing the PST back into your inbox is the right thing to do because you don't want it as a separate PST and if your mailbox is big enough. So that whole drag thing would be the better approach. But, uh, yeah. yeah. The one thing you can't do is, I put a link in the chat window, you can't do it if you've got an OST file, right? You cannot do that. That's, you have to convert it to PST mm, first. No. Mm. OSTs are offline store files. They belong mm. to IMAP and Exchange accounts and they are completely dead. They're simply there for you to look at. They cannot be used as storage mechanisms. They are volatile. They disappear. If you happen to dead damage one, particularly on a Microsoft Exchange account, you simply delete it and it rebuilds. It is an offline copy of what you have on the server. But this being a PST file, that comes from a POP account. And the only way to deal with that is that you either import it or as I say, the preferred method to me is you simply open it and drag and drop stuff to your heart's content into wherever you might wind up needing it. That way it doesn't, the contents of it doesn't wind up in your online mailbox because likely it's not, there's a bunch of stuff in there that you probably don't need. I, if I were to do it with mine, that would be exactly the same case. There's just a lot of old junk in there I don't need and doing it by drag and drop, I can simply pick up what's relevant and important and put that into my online mailbox. The rest of it sits in the PST, always available whenever I need it. How do you okay. like super aggressive there? <laughs> <laughs> I just wish he had an opinion about it. That's <laughs> Outlook Look, is my thing. PSTs gets me emotional as well. That's just a disaster. <laughs> disaster. We've had similar questions to this from time to time around this, and 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 Hal is it has a consistent response <laughs> to this. <laughs> That's good. All right, uh, question number seven. Leslie asks, I, I want to set a task for to complete all attendees prior to them attending a training session in Teams. I can't find any apps that I can link to the meeting to do that. So they. That's that's interesting. Uh, you know, I want them to complete this task, and then they can get the information to to join this training session. No, I don't agree. They're just saying prior to them attending, not prior to them getting the link to the session. Okay, prior to so, them attending. All right. So that's, so that's just. I mean, why? It depends on whether those people are together in one team. Because if they are, just use Planner. But if it's random ad hoc meetings, then. I don't know, use an email. <laughs> what about your forms? You could do a uh, quiz I, I on the form. Yeah, I think it depends on what that task is. I mean, what is it that they want them to achieve? So, of course, forms can work brilliantly. And if it's in a team, then plan a, just to give them the task. But I don't know what that task is. That's the thing is, I don't know what they are like asking those people to do. I'm saying, but if you could do it, you could start it with a quiz and forms and that then you can have a, a flow, create a planner task, or do whatever the, whatever is next after that, or, or give them the information after they've done mm -hmm. it. So that might be a, yeah. a simple way to at least start the process. But again, yeah, more information would be helpful here. Yeah, so something like that, if they complete the quiz, if they have more than, I don't know, 85% correct, then it flags it as complete. Uh, if, if under that response, if less than, then they 
you'll have to do that over. But once they get that hit that level, then it's complete. And then you can get a notification of those individuals that have completed that. And then you can automate or manually send them the invite at that time. So then the admin would only have to go and look at the list and see everybody that's completed it and only invite those people that have completed the quiz to the training. Yeah. Yep. I'm a, I, if you're talking about hundreds or thousands of people over time, then you can go in and do more of a you know automated method for that. But if you're talking about your team of 20, 30 people, and uh, then having that one manual step, not that big of a deal. It just depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah. Otherwise, you need like, to go down the full-fledged enterprise learning platform kind of scenario. Right. Which, if you remember, used to be one of the Fab 40 templates back in the day. <laughs> yep. I remember uh, that. No. Huh? I remember that. So, of course, everyone on this call is old. <laughs> <laughs> all right um question number eight yeah it's all great you know somebody just uh, presented a picture you know that was the facebook birthday sharing of photos and they shared a picture of 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 me that uh, it, and, and made a comment and there was me with a couple other people and it said everybody looks exactly the same i'm like no no <laughs> no i do not that was it was I have to be 10 years ago I just yes. got out of jail. <laughs> Thirty days of Facebook jail. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm I'm a bad man apparently. I just keep on missing what it is that you're bad about, and that really upsets me. So I keep on seeing the afterwards, like, oh my word, I'm back, and I miss what it is that got you kicked <laughs> off. And I mean, that would just make my life so interesting. But obviously, well, I'm yeah. got to like I'm work. Not gonna say it. I'm not going to say it in this public forum. But if you hang on the call after we cut off the live stream, I'll tell you what I did. I'd love to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the live stream is, yeah, it is live streaming inside of Facebook, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was when we killed the live stream already. <laughs> it was, it was we're my already, choice. We're inappropriate. Yeah, we're, we're already all flagged somewhere on a list because of uh, of hanging out with an ex-con, an ex-Facebook con. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Say, so, hey, ex-con, how did you guys know? <laughs> this this is we do operate as a Facebook uh, work release program, so that's why Neil Neil's required to do a certain number of hours with us before he's truly free. That's also called diversity and inclusion. Just putting it out. <laughs> I'm on parole. That's right. All right. Uh, question number eight. Uh, uh, Tadek says, uh, "Hey, while I'm logging into Teams, I only see a white screen. Is there anybody who has the same problem as me?" What is the solution? I've uninstalled and installed the app again, and nothing changed. So I must admit, this might be. I wish I just saw a white screen in Teams. I know. <laughs> it's like a blessing. I know. <laughs> Sometimes the blessing. <laughs> I have no so idea. I guess my question with... is: Did they say desktop or client? Have they tried to? If it is yeah. client, have they tried different? I mean, if it is web, have they tried different browsers? Um, is it machine. are they in a situation where they have to be VPNed into their their network before they can actually use it? Um, just a lot of mm -hmm. different questions to ask. Yes, yes, yep. and yes, I've seen that particular thing, and it was Teams on the back end having a tummy ache, and I waited an hour or so, and it started working after that. So, yep, yes, that is always a large thing. That's why we suggest try a different machine or a different browser and yep. wait an hour. Because yeah. Teams has tummy aches from time to time. Yes, yeah, my my no, number one response when I see that it has issues is to uh, quickly go out to the Twitterverse or other sources and and uh, scan and see if there's something bigger that's underway that's yeah. that's happening. Unfortunately, it's it's happened a few times in the last yeah. month or two. Especially in the education space. I mean, that group like had some serious hiccups with that for quite a couple of days. So, um, yep. Yeah, I know that SharePoint and Teams have been targeted by hackers. You know, you can't have this kind of immense growth and then not see that as a hacker's target. 
So there's a lot going on. Um, all right, question number nine. Simha says, uh, how do I restart or bounce the Azure Components Clusters VMs? This is uh, somewhat of a confusing question, but uh, I mean, it's the, it's called the Azure Portal. So, you know, or PowerShell or the Azure CLI um, or Cloud Shell. Um, there's yeah. probably a dozen different ways that you can restart or restart method. bounce. Yeah. PowerShell's more bounce. Uh, yeah. Well, and then there's also the WAC, right? So you can go through the Windows Admin Center mm -hmm. um, and you can bounce clusters to the Windows Admin Center. So if that's what it, they're talking about, clusters in Azure, you can do that as well. So yeah, I guess uh, it depends on what, what gives you the least administrative overhead to use a classic terminology in a Microsoft exam question. I'm trying to understand. I mean, if they actually created these machines and they have the permissions to actually bounce these machines, how they would not know that they could use the method which they created them to restart mm -hmm. them. So need a little bit more information on what they're trying to do and, you know, the kind of permissions they have. <laughs> Mark, are you just waving? Are you departing? Are you, do you have a question? No, oh, he's leaving. There we go. There's the answer. Yeah, so that's that's one where even as a non-dev, yeah, it was just kind of, you know, he could have said something out loud, but just you know, just disappeared. Um, but, uh, you know, as a, as a non-dev and look, I have resources. I have uh, my site, the two sites that are running out in Azure and it was pretty straightforward to go in and find the restart button on those, the services and so okay anyway all right question number 10 yehuda hi someone may know if and how we can embed an html5 preview file on modern sharepoint the file is an interactive file so it's important not to change the type of it so embedding and an HTML5 preview file on a modern SharePoint site. Well, you know, Christian, normally I would have the answer for this, being the SharePoint person <laughs> that's on the call. That's right. You know, but uh, that's, a, that's a joke for everybody who doesn't know. Yeah. I, I don't like what? SharePoint. <laughs> yeah. When when Sean is not here or Sean and Neil are not here, then uh the then Mike is our go to SharePoint person. That's right. And telephony. and telephony. And telephony. And telephony. Well, we're all telephony experts, Mike. You can't you can't own that bragging right. So we're all there. <laughs> uh, I mean there's there's I'm just in a I'm just in a quick search. There's a couple of videos on how to do it. I don't know whether it's specifically to HTML5 or what the outcome would be, but just a quick search. Preview HTML5 on SharePoint in a Bing search gives me a whole bunch of stuff coming back. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if this is something, you know, th this is this is like in the old the olden days where you'd iframe something into a website, you know, a, a, a page like this. And so you can, you know, you it was a pretty straightforward. I'm just not familiar with the nuances of the situation with with SharePoint modern sites. Oh, and and Mike unceremoniously departed as well. Wow. Goodness. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's so actually, could, you, could you pick on him the whole time? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. There's but, actually an answers.microsoft.com question on this and the response from one of the from Alex Chen I don't know if you know him he's been around for a long time as a, a moderator on that platform says it's not possible but that was it's almost a year old though so but it is uh, for online for on premises it's still you had lots of workarounds but online I'm pretty sure the creator folks can do it but not out of the box yeah it doesn't it doesn't say whether it's online or uh, it's, it's too old I wouldn't I wouldn't trust anything that's a year old 
<laughs> so if there's a discussion about it and somebody claiming, is that a Microsoft person, Neil? Yeah, so um, Alex Chen, I'll put the link in the chat window just for okay. for information if you choose to use it or not. But it, it looks a little old to me. And it doesn't, so, it doesn't say whether it's SharePoint Online or SharePoint On-Premises. This is one of those, those issues where, um, so yeah, going and doing a quick search and maybe Huda had not found anything and so posted the question, mm -hmm. but would, um, you know, it, it, if you're not finding anything, the next place to go and, and check the two locations is any discussion out of Microsoft Tech Community. And then of course out on, um, uh, post your your request out to hang on let me yeah i'd, I'd be also interested that. to understand you know what what is and um, obviously when you say a html file html well html5 regardless of the version what what, what is it you, the file is actually interactive what is it doing because it might be that there's an alternative way maybe it's showing a video right yeah. so let's a better stream feed maybe it's something else you know it, it there's a lot of alternatives to just embedding HTML. Well, but so so again, it was as I say, it's like if it's uh, any missing feature, something that you require, you're not finding it anywhere. Also, go and check in user voice, see if others have already requested it, and if if they have, there's a relevant request, then upvote that. If not, add the request. I mean, Microsoft needs to have that that feedback. In fact, if you can send once you post it to user voice, send it to four people that you know. If they go in and upvote that, all you need are five upvotes and Microsoft will review it. So they may not respond to it or they may respond and say, known issue, um, you know, it, it's already on the roadmap or, hey, this is a low priority. I mean, they could come back with a response to it, but they will respond. Or they will review it with as few as five upvotes. And I can verify that because for a long time I was the SharePoint moderator or one of the SharePoint moderators on that platform. Yep. Nothing gets ignored. Nothing gets ignored. Microsoft is doing a great job at, at listening and reviewing. You might, again, you might not be satisfied with the answer where they come back and say, you know, there's little value in us providing this. Um, so there are a number of workarounds. Good luck to you. That could be. Well, I've shared the blog with you, so it all the because the only web part that you can use is embedded code. Okay, so you're quite restricted because the I mean you don't have the script editor and things anymore. So if it works in that embedded code web part, then it'll work. So there's a blog there from uh, SharePoint Maven. Where where is the blog post link? Did you it, post it in chat? In the chat. I and, didn't see it, but then chat frequently breaks down. Oh, there we go. There it is. And you have there to. So you obviously have to go and set your um, HTML field security on the tenant, not on the tenant, on the site collection as well. But some of them don't work and some of them do work. So I just suggest that they try the embedded code web part, but it depends on what that code, code looks like. So. Yeah. Because I, I, guess get another, mm -hmm. I guess another option you could, uh, I'll be overstretching, but you could potentially do something with SPFX, use the framework. No, no, it's probably not. Yeah, it's probably too much work though for what, what they're trying to achieve. All right. All right. Let's uh, jump to the next one. Question number eleven. Claudia says, "Hello. Can someone guide me on how to upload data from a URL that's on a website to a blob storage, please? It's a lot of data, so I can't download it to my computer. Please help." So to go from a from a URL from a third party site over to a blob storage container. Is it like a I mean it's a URL, right? Is it is it a link to like a you know enormous zip file or is she trying to pull something from another storage container that's behind that URL? There's there's so many so great questions. Here. The answer is yes, one of those things, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of detail I can get to. You know? um, I mean, it's a tough one. I mean, you can, uh, the, the, I guess, from blob storage. When you say blob storage, I'm making an assumption that we're referring to Azure blob storage here, um, although it could be well, any Why would anybody use storage. anything else, Neil? Come on. Well, of no, course. Of course, I mean, of course um, it's Azure blob storage. 
I don't know. Can, I mean, there's tools. If you look at the, what the hell is that tool called? There is a, I can't remember what it's called. It's third party, but you can connect to put, basically load. Like a, it's like the old school having file explorer, source and destination, and you drag and drop. But the question is, does the source support that type of functionality? I don't know. But I used to use it all the time with Azure to pull VMs from one place to another and all kinds of things. But um, I don't know. It yeah. sounds like a well. Uh, it's, it's it's impossible to know without understanding what that URL is. I think. Right. Like so, Claudia. Um, yeah, we need to know more about the source. What 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 the location is? What the file type? What the format of that is? Whether that other location offers export capability or I mean that's another issue I mean accessing that being able to read it and scrape it m migrate it export it you know usually sites like that I'm, I was thinking like I pointed my son to who's a um, um, what's his major I know he's a stem kid looking at um, uh, like the various weather sciences um, and he so I, you know, Microsoft made these announcements about all this data that they're sharing that's weather related. Um, and NASA has some different resources, things that are out there and pointed him towards that. And they, he's he's learning how to go and access some of that data and do some things with it. But that's the first thing I thought of, like I point him to these massive data sources, you know, accessing that, getting that, pulling it down, um, how he was doing that. It was actually a, you know, over in. Power BI was being able to point to that directly. But again, there was a utility and the data was set up, was established to be able to link over and be utilized by Power BI. So anyway, all right. Well, we can sit here and speculate about the format or we can jump to question number 12. Uh, Diogo says, I'm wondering if someone knows how to automatically send an image taken with a camera control and power apps to the attachment field of approvals through Power Automate. Any help would be helpful. Help would be helpful, yes. Yeah, so I, I, to the... I got nothing. Not my, not my area, I'm afraid. I wish it was. Mine either. Um, sometime we're gonna have to learn, but not right now. I think the... Uh, yeah, Tracy, do you have any experience with this? As far as I know, it's still an attachment. Hey? So it depends on how they've set up that app and map that fields back to wherever it is that they want to drop it. So they're talking about approvals, but I mean, that could just be a list or a Microsoft list or something. But it, the, the Power App definitely does see it as an attachment. So I, um, it's, according to me, it's definitely possible. But it's how the app's built. It's whatever they've mapped it. Yep. Yeah, that was my thought too. Attachment is just a, a field. You can place data inside of that. You should be able to automatically go in and do it. Like I, I, this is not my my area of expertise to going and doing that. But um, yeah, this is seems like you know there's a number of people we could point them towards to to get answers to this. You know what, I'm going to, um, let me take this as homework, but I'm gonna forward it to a couple people and might get a, a response for, for next week. It seems like we should be able to get a pretty easy answer from somebody that is living and breathing inside this stuff. Like, for example, example, I'll also forward it over to Laura Rogers will be one of the couple yeah. people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have a few people in, in internal in the old PFE organization as well that we can ask if they got that information. I yeah, we'll, we'll Wednesday if I remember. I'll add it to uh, next week's homework. So if we get a response back from anybody, we can report back on that next week. Uh, all right, uh, so we have another 15 minutes. Um, question number 13, Sabrina. Uh, my nonprofit company is using Teams for its main org and now needs to open two different departments working separately. Is it possible with the same account manager and license? 
Is there a way to switch between uh, departments, not teams or channels? That's the stickler there of the same org. Um, so if you are um, if you are creating three different tenants, you can federate between those tenants and make it easy to move across in between those those tenants. Um, so as we were talking about earlier, Microsoft has uh, different tenants, a uh, tenant that's out there where they federate with a number of partners, like where it's really easy for me to collaborate. So because, you know, so AdPoint, for example, has a federated, uh, uh, it, it, you know, relationship as a very senior partner with Microsoft. And so, uh, so I, as my AvPoint login in Teams, I can see as another um, team, this Microsoft team, uh, even though it's over on, you know, in the Microsoft tenant. So it's a federated thing. So, so it's easy to see and to move it between those. I mean, most organizations, if you, if there's not a reason for um, having the multiple tenants, you can have and keep separated the the various teams on a single tenant. Um, but if there's a requirement, if you have subdivisions, you have separate legal entities to where you need to have that line of demarcation in between your, your digital assets and have three separate tenants, then that's something that you can do is just add people that need to work across those tenants to each of the different tenants or federate in between them. I don't know. Anything anybody would add to that? No. Nope. Makes sense to me. I posted a video for you from, um, is it Shane Young? That does the attachment from camera for power oh. action and power and power automate. As I see two links from you so is that yeah the first, the first one got me onto the video so the first one was the one on the forum where they kept on discussing it and then someone shared the link okay so the last one's the video i will add that even though it's from shane ah <laughs> don't be mean don't be mean shane shane's no, shane's awesome he's hilarious uh, shane's cows uh, on twitter no he's great uh -huh. Uh, let's see. I think he's doing well. I don't, I don't see him that much out there. I see stuff from Laura all the time, but I know he's yeah, doing a lot of the training stuff as well. He's very busy. Yeah, I haven't heard, I haven't heard from him in a long time. I think normally I only ever see him at, um, when we were, when we were doing person conferences though. Yep. Um, but so it's been a long time I'm used to the Shane and Todd show, but we don't see that yep. these days. Yep. Todd, Todd's over at some praxis now. And I think just, uh, he's, oh, with Mark? Uh, I, Yep. Oh, cool. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I don't don't see him that much in online activities either, but he's just heads down busy working on client stuff, doing very well. And I think Shane is just uh, busy with his new training company. And I, once in a while, I'll see a link, especially out on Facebook and various communities being shared around. But, um, yeah, I haven't interacted with him much. So, But then again, the last year, haven't interacted with many people. Mm-hmm. You interacted yeah. with me. We met at a conference. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Are you going to the next and, one? Uh, well, so the next one I, I is the in Orlando <clears throat> is the Microsoft 365, uh, uh, the formerly the the North American SharePoint conference that, that was in Vegas has moved to. So that's the second week in June or first week, second week in June in Orlando. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. Branson. I'll be at Branson. I've got, I've got two yeah, sessions. Yeah, I'll, I'll be in Branson workshop. as well in August. Yeah, mm -hmm. so my – just just quick comment on this on in-person events. So I've started to see a couple that are being planned for in-person, almost all of those hybrid that are happening this fall. I, I just feel like uh, – like I have no problem. Vaccinated. Um, our state is largely open. In fact, I just commented in a blog post this weekend – I went to a movie with my son on Saturday, no masks, wide open. It just, I walked in with my mask and, and uh, everybody that worked there mask free, they're like, nope, there's no state mandate where it's up to the businesses. The owners of the business said masks are not necessary. There's still, you know, a lot of people walking around wearing masks there. If you're uncomfortable, like just continue wearing a mask, but socially distancing was still being, you know, a, uh, a, uh, enforced with the dots on the ground of where to stand to keep distance from people 
but otherwise than that, you know, popped off the mask and had no problem. In Texas, in Texas, obviously they lifted the mandate, but a lot of businesses, it's like it's the, your choice, right? It's a business's choice. Yep. Now a lot of the a lot of the signs have changed from mandatory to recommended. Yep. Well, here here's the thing where where it, it, just just uh, sorry, gonna gonna go political here just for a second. It's like. <laughs> Regardless of your feelings on the effectiveness of masks, if you enter a private business and they ask you to wear a mask, you have to wear a mask. There's no right to not wear a mask in a private business, period. Yep. Anyway. I don't, I don't so. think that's political. It's just common sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, there's some people, people will see it that way, though. <laughs> <laughs> there's plenty yeah. of stupid to go around for everybody. Yeah. So anyway. All right, uh, so let's jump to the next one. Yeah, so I'm oh, oh, on that 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 point. So I, I'm I I don't think I'm going to be attending in person in Orlando. I think it's just you know as far as um, there's just too many other events that are going on that are online, and so my, for me it's just physically traveling and dedicated the time. It's like I don't have the time to go and be in person at an event that that soon. I need to plan around it. I will be in in Branson. I may be driving so that I have yeah, the vehicle there and might bring one of my one of my sons with me. Yeah, we're driving to Branson. Um, also, Matt Cashman reached out to me last week. Um, Microsoft is going to put a full body on the ground, multiple bodies mm -hmm. on the ground at SP Fest in Dallas. Oh, year. nice. So nice. he's asked me if I'll, because since I live here, he's like, will, will you represent? I'm like, of course I'll be there. No question. Yeah. So. And what, what's the time to get that there one? anyway? I can't. Oh, I'm trying to remember. It's. I'd have to go check on the dates again, but it's uh, it's after, definitely after Branson, so it's like September, October. So it's a Q4. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, is that the one they're not doing it in Chicago anymore in Q4 in December? Is it is it December? Yeah, I think it might be December. SP Fest runs at various times of the year in different different locations. Yeah. Um. So I've been a couple times in the middle middle of winter in Chicago there, where the snow comes sideways, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the roads are icy and gone. I mean, it's still a great event so, and well attended. Yeah, Chicago's July twenty sixth. DC is okay. September twentieth, and Dallas is October eleven. Okay. Well, that's great to see things pick up again so it'll be exciting to see you know everybody again of course we were at uh, branson last year in was it september last year i remember whatever yes, it was it was september yeah. it was weird the hybrid kind of thing mike did a great job mike and yeah, stephanie well, did a fa fabulous job putting that conference on well I'll, I'll say thank you because i helped run the hybrid but yeah so yeah, i will i'm <laughs> I'm, or, I, I'm organizing that again um this year so We'll All right, let's see. Uh, we get one or two questions still in here. Um, let's see. Uh, number 14, Ashik says, uh, why is it that lookup column can be edited in SharePoint lists form, but can it be edited in SharePoint mobile app? Lookup column is showing as read only in SharePoint app, but editable in web? It's a known issue and it's on user voice. It's not solved. Okay. Shared the link with you. So still the case. I even saw it recently. Someone uh, mentioned it. So it's definitely still lying on user voice. There's two different ones. I will add those in. Those in as well. Copy the link. Thank you for those. All right. And number 15, Judith asks, we're considering creating a discussion forum team with channels for employees to discuss specific applications, Teams, OneDrive, et cetera. The goal is for colleagues to help each other navigate Office 365 and the collaboration tools by sharing tips and asking or responding to questions specific to that application. For technical questions, they will be told to submit a help desk ticket. Has anyone set up a discussion forum team for their org and have advice on how to set it up for success? Also, our org does not have Yammer because that was going to be my answer. Yep. Because you've just described one of the great use cases, yeah. the scenarios that is you know, Yammer is strong 
at uh, resolving. Well, especially if you use the hashtags and stuff, because then they can use one group and just hashtag the products. It just makes it easier. But I mean, I've done this with teams as well. You end up with a channel per product, but it's nice because they can share resources in each channel. They can add tabs to like web resources and things. So a team works quite well for it. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think if, w without having the, you know, Yammer social platform, you are creating an org wide team and then yeah. creating the channels for each one of those. Um, again, it's not it's not the best. It's not going to raise you know, the visibility. It's not, it's not going to be the same as using Yammer for that. Um, yeah. But yeah, because you really there's a lot more curation that has to happen manually because of that, not having that those other tools that are developed for this. And I definitely wouldn't do it as an org wide team. Then she's saying they don't have Yammer. I bet you they do have Yammer. It's just switched off. But um, yeah, if um, if if it's a team, I wouldn't do an org wide. I would do one of those. What do they call it? Uh, like public or something where you can get a join code. So that people can actually decide, same as with Yammer, whether because if you make that an org wide thing, it will be chaos. I think so. Well, it depends on the size of the org, but yeah, I mean, you've got different. Like in my company, there. it's not a problem at all. <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, if you have issues, you know right where to take those. Brom. Yep, to Brom. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, some other. I mean, uh, go ahead. I say to Tracy's point, Yammer has probably been disabled. It's not. They don't. Have yeah, it. at once. I mean, not if that. Well, obviously, because they um, they're using Teams and OneDrive, so they've been told they don't have Yammer. <laughs> you know. <laughs> They gotta like help this ticket come back and say sorry, we didn't buy the Yammer license. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, there's a lot of other things that you can do. I mean, again, depending on the organization, this is more of a, you know, what what do you, what do you want? What are you trying to do? There's things that you can go and do. You can create. Uh, I mean, you can you can uh, utilize. Um, you know, like the the tags capabilities, so that you can come up with a naming convention for each of these to make it really easily searchable around each one of those. You could have like hashtag Teams tips, hashtag OneDrive tips, yeah. hashtag SharePoint tips, so that people can easily find and surface that information. So they may, and you can leave it open. You may not force people to go and no. join it, but that if they do that search, they find more of this content or discussion happening around that topic and may find their way over into those channel discussions. Yeah. Um, that, so like with uh, with Yammer, I mean, because obviously it's, it's typical, it's like everything else. I was helping a company yesterday about with Teams, just a friend of mine, and she like said she had like dreams about Teams last night, but good ones. <laughs> but uh, because they for two years only used Teams to make calls and have meetings, they didn't know that they could do all the other stuff. But that's the same as with Yammer. You know, it gets uh, sh shut down quite a lot where people don't understand how it can be used. But that whole, what uh, with, because I mean, it's also about bringing it in where they work. So I think they must push back and get Yammer, okay? Because if they have one group and they use those hashtags or like topics, right? I normally on SharePoint go and build a page with uh, like three columns. And then I surface the specific hashtag and column. So I'll say teams and there's the, but it's the same group. And then I add that page to the org wide team or something. So you can actually scan through it and see the latest team stuff or the latest OneDrive stuff, even though it's one big group. Because that also helps people that are new to Yammer, you know, to quickly find something, but to actually see a focus per group, even though it's one Yammer group. So that works quite well, bringing it in on a SharePoint page as well. Yep. Anywho. Well, one other problem with using Teams is that, I mean, it is, it's more project in time specific so it's just a different utility for this I mean what's one thing that yammer is really strong at uh, is is uh, uh and I saw this with in prior companies where you know a year after a conversation happened and somebody will find it there might be new information they go and update that and it resurfaces that automatically and yeah. people then jump into the latest and you've got all the history that's attached to it so it truly is a community based knowledge center yeah. uh, of those those hints and tips and best practices. So it does that really well. Yeah. I think Judith must ask the question, like firstly, go and check out what license they have. 
and then go back to IT and say, you know, we were thinking. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, again, you create a team, create the channels, um, figure out your know, naming convention for those hashtags and use those those kind of out of the box capabilities there. Um, and it'll certainly work um, to, to that degree. So I think as you start building volume around that, you're going to figure out more and more the limitations of that method versus go and move all that over to Yammer. But yeah, anyway, well, listen, we are we are at the uh, the half or I guess the the we're at the end of this segment, the 90 minutes of this uh, live stream. Thank you to Tracy, Neil, Hal, of course, those others whose names I've forgotten already that have left us Mike and Mark. <laughs> Um, but uh, thanks for, for joining this. Of course, the recording of this will be out on the Collab Talk channel out on YouTube and also on my blog post at Buckley Planet. So later this evening, I will go through and catalog every one of the uh, message center uh, topics as well as every question that we uh, attempted to address. I think we did a pretty good job here answering questions. You know, there, there's a couple like, I don't know, that we're going to go and do some more work around. Um, but you can find those out on buckleyplanet.com. And of course, we'll be back next week at Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific, as we are every week. We'll be back with a yes. new set of 15 to 20 questions and go from there. So thanks so much to everybody Stop. for participating. Thank Stop you. The questions we didn't answer today. Yes. Yes, and we will add in so the other questions. What are there? Five more that we didn't get to. They will be at the top of the list for next week. So excellent. So if you were waiting, so if you are John, Stefan, Andrew, uh, Patricus, or Ere, sorry, <laughs> we didn't get to your questions. So uh, ap apologize for that. But uh, we'll be back next week. So thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you. Yes, see you later. Thank you. Okay, bye. So I'll start my mood, mood music again here. So.